Kenny Ray and Damo were in like the ones, ones and twos. I mean, she puts all the rest all together. Yeah. Hmm. There's the three and three. Yeah. I don't know who's down there with them. I haven't made it that far down the hall. I am getting better. It's working. <laughs> Um, I, I actually haven't asked them. I don't know. I will reach out to them and ask if they can help us with, with the refuge meal. So then I'll ask them if they're watching this. But I, I'm embarrassed because I've floundered so much with this and it hasn't been, it hasn't been a good transmission. Although uh, Shane assures me that the, the days I am able to get it going, like today, it, it does record. He, he says he plays it back to make sure it's working. So, yeah. So we'll get started on the lesson. As you're aware, I have voiced this opinion many times. I think the authors of these lessons start in awkward places. This one, this was such an awkward place to start. We've got to go back and read the verses preceding today's lesson that starts in Luke chapter 24, verse 18. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to start with verse 18 because it's in the middle of a question. You've got to know the background of why Cleopas was asking that, that question. So let's go back to verse 13. So I'll read verses 13 through 17, then we'll consider why that was important as the background for what happened during the rest of today's lesson. So chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Um, I'm reading out of the ESV translation, so yours may be a little different, but still the message will be there. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. So that's verses 13 through 17. That, that's, you, you've got to read that to, to pick up on what's happening in verse 18. So two people, the, Luke's version doesn't identify both of them as being men. So that's speculation whether or not this was Cleopas and his wife. It could have been him and his wife, or it could have been Cleopas and a younger person, or Cleopas and an older person. So let's just assume that it was, his, it was a friend of his, a traveling companion. That's kind of the assumption, I think, of most people that read this uh, introduction to the story of the road to Emmaus. So they were deep in conversation talking about what had happened. This is Sunday afternoon. Jesus uh, rose from the grave Sunday morning, we know at dawn. And then Mary and the women that uh, found the empty tomb went and reported to the other followers, the disciples. And then Peter and John raced back to the grave to confirm what the, the women had reported, that the tomb was empty. So here was this man named Cleopas. Now we don't know much about Cleopas other than he, based upon what he says during the rest of the lesson, all the, all the uh, uh, background of him indicates that he was probably a believer. He probably knew of Jesus. So he was very sad and very upset as he was leaving Jerusalem. And the assumption is that he lived in Emmaus and this person that was with, her, with him, whether it was Cleopas's wife or a relative or a traveling companion, that that person probably lived in Emmaus too. Emmaus was about seven miles east of Jerusalem, so it would have been several hours walking journey from Jerusalem to get back to Emmaus. So here it was late in the afternoon as these two people were walking along. All of a sudden, a stranger is with them. So that would have been upsetting for this person to suddenly appear. You don't know, uh, Cleopas and the person with him didn't know who this person was. There's some scholars suggest that they may have been afraid that this was a Roman spy or a Jewish spy wanting to overhear the conversation of believers about where Jesus was at. 
thinking that, that any conversation among believers might have led the Jewish leaders uh, to, to either recover. The Jewish leaders assumed Jesus was dead, that there was a body missing that they would have wanted to recover. And probably that was the same opinion of the Roman leaders when the Roman uh, soldiers or officials were told that Jesus was missing. They probably wanted every shred of, of conversation they could overhear among the disciples or among the believers as to what had happened to Jesus. So that's, that's the background that brings us to today's lesson, of course, which picks up there in verse 18. Deborah, would you read verse 18? The one named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? So Cleopas was probably very frustrated by this stranger asking him what was going on. Uh, he might have even, as I said, possibly been afraid of this person, not knowing who this person was. And the verses I read said that their eyes prevented them from recognizing Jesus. So the, there's speculation as to why this situation occurred. Either some scholars say, well, it was Satan, Satan that prevented Cleopas and his, his uh, companion from recognizing Jesus. Another theory is it was Jesus and God that wanted these two strangers, I mean, these two people, Cleopas and the other companion, not to initially identify or not to initially recognize Jesus when Jesus appeared in their midst. So just think if that were to happen to you or I, if we were walking along and suddenly a mystery person appeared, which was Jesus, and we couldn't or didn't recognize them, that would be you know, a, a situation that um, would certainly be life-changing, change, as it probably was for Cleopas as we go through the rest of the story here uh, and get to the outcome. Um, Wayne, read verses 19 and 20, please. And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and worked before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. So Jesus' answer, what things, he wasn't denying that he didn't know what things they Cleopas and the companion had been talking about. And as Jesus, and of, as Jesus often did in his teaching opportunities throughout his ministry, when a question was put to Jesus, he responded with a question. So here Cleopas put a question to Jesus. Jesus didn't directly answer Cleopas, but he answered with the question, what things? So here was a rhetorical question. Jesus, of course, knew what things Cleopas and his companion had been talking about, what they were concerned about, uh, but he used that question as the bridge to his explanation to them to help them understand their misunderstanding of what the Messiah, the concept of the Messiah was all about. Any questions or comments? Okay. Um, Kathleen, verses 21, 22, 23, and 24. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. So here, uh, Cleopas is giving a truthful account of what he understood had happened earlier in the day and his expectations of what should have happened. Of course, Cleopas and the other believers expected if Jesus was who he truly claimed to be, he was there to overthrow the Roman government. Jesus was there to put down the leadership of the Jewish officials and that, in Cleopas's mind, was not or had not happened so far in that day. Um, there was some doubt in his mind that the women actually understood what they saw when they arrived at the tomb. 
He didn't say that the women saw angels. He said they had a vision of angels. So in Cleopas's mind, the angels weren't really there in physical, as physical beings, that they were just visions or dreams that the women um, experienced when they arrived at the tomb that morning. Any questions or comments? So by, by, this, by this reply of Cleopas and answering Jesus' question, what things, Cleopas was revealing he had low expectations of this prophet. And he referred, he didn't refer to Jesus as the Messiah, he referred to him as a prophet. So in Cleopas' thinking, this wasn't, that Jesus wasn't fulfilling the, all the prophets' um, predictions that the, that the Messiah was going to be there and was going to redeem Israel. So the Cleopas' understanding of redemption was not spiritual redemption at all. Not that the, Jesus the Messiah by redeeming mankind would be offering the idea of grace and forgiveness of sins he only considered redemption, meaning the political redemption of the nation of Israel to come out from under the yoke of Roman government and, and the oppression of the Jewish leaders, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the, the priest in the Jewish temple. So um, G Cleopas was, was revealing not only his misunderstanding of the situation, but the misunderstanding of probably still most of the disciples at this point on Easter, because the disciples had not yet seen the physical return of Jesus as he, of course, spent weeks with them before his final departure into heaven <coughs> later on. There in verse 22, the word moreover could be translated to mean the same as uh, but also. So I'm going to read verse 22 again and use the phrase, but also instead of moreover. So let's look at 22. Let's say, but also some of the women in our group <coughs> astounded us. So Cleopas is, is continuing to, to recall more information of what he had observed when the women reported back to the disciples. They were puzzled. They didn't understand how, of course, how the body of Jesus could have disappeared. They, they knew they didn't have it. The disciples didn't have the body. There was no reporting by Roman officials that they had the body. There was no reporting by uh, anyone that they had taken the body of Jesus out of the tomb. Any thoughts or comments? So we could say that Cleopas and the other followers of Jesus wanted proof positive that Jesus was resurrected. And they didn't have proof positive that he was resurrected. Okay, Sarah verses 25, 26, and 27. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So in verses 25 and 26, Jesus is really rebuking, really calling out Cleopas and his companion. He's really giving them a, a, a lesson back in scripture when he, re, when he refers to the prophets. The prophets had revealed this, they had spoken, they had predicted this was going to happen. And scripture had said, Old Testament scripture had made it clear that the Messiah was going to suffer when he was here on earth. So Jesus was using this as a teaching opportunity because it was necessary. He, need, he needed to set, set straight the thinking of Cleopas and Cleopas's companion about what had happened that day. Um, and Cleopas and his companion had no idea that, 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 that the Messiah did, did need to suffer. The Messiah was not going to suddenly reign in glory without going through the, the, the suffering of, of 
the death that he uh, endured. The phrase enter into his glory has two meanings. So if Jesus was entering into his glory, it could refer to his re-entry into heaven. That's one interpretation of, of enter into his glory. Or it could have also meant, and scholars, some scholars interpret that phrase to mean Jesus' second coming. He's going to re-enter in glory when Jesus does, uh, does carry out his second coming and return to earth. Uh, and of course, the, the, the disciples thought it was going to happen very quickly. They, that's one of the big complaints that non-believers have today. Well, Jesus said he was going to return. It, it, it hasn't happened, so why should I accept, change my worldview of things? From a non-believer's perspective, they would say, why should I join the view of you fellow Christians that Jesus is coming? He's had 2,000 years to do it, and it hasn't happened, so why should I, as an atheist or an ag agnostic, change my views and accept this belief, this hope that Christianity has that your Messiah is going to return to earth and overcome Satan? Any thoughts or comments? It's funny how that we as people think it should happen in our time. Mm -hmm. like, you know, for me to believe it, it's got to happen in, in yeah. my lifetime. Even if it happened back then, you know, when he first came, it didn't happen in my lifetime, so I'm not going to believe it. If it hadn't happened before I die, I'm not going to believe it. So it's like we think we're so special. It right. Just has to do it when we're <coughs> wanting to do it. Otherwise, we're not going to believe. It. Yeah. When not not it. not only not believe, but believe, believe only with a very faint, weak faith, mm -hmm. and not because of a faint, having a faint or weak faith, not doing God's will and listening to him for direction in the things he wants us to do. When Luke said, beginning with Moses and the prophets, that was kind of uh, Luke's shorthand for saying that, that, he, that he was being told the story by someone who knew it was important for, for Cleopas and his companion to understand the Old Testament prophecies that they weren't showing uh, that they had a correct understanding. They had, Cleopas and his companion certainly would have read Old Testament prophecies, so they understood the words, but they didn't understand the meaning of the words of the prophecies of the Old Testament. So continuing on, I'll read verses 28 and 29. They came near the village, so that mean, means all three of them. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave, meaning Jesus gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. So hospitality was an important concept to the Jewish culture at that time. It was a custom for a, a Jewish person to always extend hospitality to a stranger. Just think how different our lives would be if everyone in our world extended hospitality to everyone else. We, we you know, are fearful, often fearful of strangers, fearful of what could happen, and, and it was it, indications were that was less likely in Jewish culture at that time. In fact, it was part of Jewish law that uh, strangers be extended hospitality. In the book of Leviticus, in chapter 19, it says, you shall, do, you shall not do to a stranger wrong, and you shall love him as yourself. So that part of Jewish law from Leviticus is very closely attuned to the New Testament teachings of love your neighbor. And then another example in the book of Deuteronomy where Jewish law was outlined. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, it says, love the sojourner, that's my translation, or love the traveler. For you were sojourners, or you were travelers in the land of Egypt. So the book of Deuteronomy was bringing to mind, bringing to the uh, attention of the Old Testament people that had arrived in the promised land, that they were 
travelers, so to speak, or sojourners when they lived in Egypt. And they would have enjoyed hospitality from the Egyptians, which they didn't really get because they were treated as slaves by the Egyptians. So here, here are two examples from Old Testament law that confirm that it was important for Jewish people to extend hospitality to strangers. So Luke's account of Cleopas and his companion doesn't say that the companion lived as a neighbor to Cleopas, but the, the assumption is that the, the companion did live in Emmaus as Cleopas did, and the either person, and assu assuming the companion wasn't Cleopas' wife, assuming the companion with Cleopas was a friend, another believer, hospitality may have been offered by both people, even though Luke doesn't mention it here. Um, and it would be interesting to know because Luke wasn't there. Luke didn't witness Cleopas' encounter with Jesus. It would be interesting to know how much of their conversation occurred during this stretch of time between Jesus and Cleopas that is not accounted for in this story. Um, I suspect that, that um, there was more conversation than scripture reveals in the verses that we're studying in, in today's lesson. It would be, it'd be interesting to know what else was said as, they, as the three people, Jesus, Cleopas, and his companion were continuing to walk in, into uh, Emmaus. So at this point, because Cleopas did extend this offer hospitality, it shows he was no longer afraid of this person who yet hadn't identified himself as Jesus. Um, so that brings us to the conclusion of today's story as we look at the final verses of verses 30 and 31. It was as he was reclining, was reclined, that means as Jesus was reclined at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him but he disappeared from their sight. So Jesus assumes a very unusual role here. Jesus assumes the role of the host. And that was unusual. Why would a stranger suddenly assume the role of a host in someone else's home at someone else's meal? But Jesus took this role. Um, the leader's guide cautions us not to assume this, that Jesus wanted to replay the Lord's Supper. Of course, he left the disciples a couple days earlier before being crucified at the scene of the Lord's Supper. So the, the scholars suggest that, that we need to be careful and not assuming that Jesus felt the need to, to, to replay exactly what happened at the Lord's Supper, but he did take the role of the host there in Cleopas's home. Um, now, what are the possible reasons for the eyes of Cleopas and his companion to have been closed? Well, that, I, I covered that earlier. I kind of skipped ahead of my lesson, but Jesus then made them suddenly recognize who he was. So just think of, of how astounding that would have been to Cleopas and his companion to suddenly see they were in the presence of Jesus. They were experiencing this miracle of the Messiah suddenly being with them. Um, the, the story leaves us there kind of in suspense. We don't, we don't have any verbal response from Cleopas, but I would assume that Cleopas and his companion, they might have initially been speechless when they, when they first understood they were looking at Jesus, but that must have led to some conversation. I would assume that Cleopas and his companion, whether it was his wife or another male, they might have, they would have, they would have wanted to ask Jesus, how, how did you suddenly regain life? What are you going to do now? What should we be doing now that we understand that you're alive, that the Messiah is still alive? I, I could think of a whole range, a whole basket full of questions that they probably would have had to him or exclamations of Cleopas and 
his companion of what they felt led to do now that they had experienced this miracle of being in the presence of their Messiah. Any thoughts or comments? Well, his, about his appearance is even Mary didn't recognize him in the garden. Yeah. So his body must have been different. He must have looked different because he's glorified now, maybe. Um, but I think in the excitement of knowing that it was him, I think the whole thing would have been just go out and tell everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they would have had any questions. I think they would have been so excited about it. They wanted to let everybody know that he was alive. They, they might have been questioning, though, if they could do this safely without getting arrested by the Romans or being detained by the Jewish leaders. Um, but would they have cared? That's I a good mean, question. Because think about, I mean, they're being with Jesus for so long, the disciples went out and they, they proclaimed Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, the, the risen Savior, they didn't care. I mean, well, they did. I'm sure they did, but they, they had a purpose, and they were beaten, and they were killed. So, But they still did it. Right. The whole purpose was to tell the world. So maybe they, they weren't worried about being beaten at that point. I don't know, or being caught. Maybe some were, but. So our, our lesson next week that finishes this quarterly study appropriately is Jesus commissioning the disciples to carry on his work before he ascends into heaven. So we'll continue and finish with Luke chapter 24 next week. Aren't you not gonna be here next week? That's right. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. I encourage you to read the, and study the lesson at home. Yes, I will not be here. <laughs> I'll, I'll read it also and study it myself. Uh, so then two weeks from today, two weeks from today, pro what I'll probably do is, is spend a few minutes talking about this lesson that, we're, that we won't have a chance to talk about next week before we start the next quarter with the new study guides with um, Job and Ecclesiastes. Okay, I'm gonna stop our